Hi folks, this is Dr. Lolita Calabria and today I'm going to provide a basic introduction to Crestose lichen identification. Let's begin with some basic definitions. Crestose lichens are those lichens that are tightly attached to the substrates on which they grow, whether it be bark, wood, soil, rock, or man-made substrates like metal or uh, wooden fence posts or cars. Lichens can pretty much grow anywhere. So the ones that are really tightly attached to the substrates are the crust lichens. This picture, this illustration shows you how lichens, um, the crustose form of lichens can grow almost intermixed with their substrates at times. So if you look on the example on the right, you see that there's layers of bark intermixed with the medulla and the photobiont layer. Um, so some crustose lichens have a thallus structure that consists of an upper cortex, like you see here, the photobiont layer and the medulla, but typically there's no lower, lower cortex. And some lack an upper cortex altogether, and some of them can be considered what we call leprose lichens, which are composed entirely of powdery granules. And so we'll learn about these different names that we can use to describe the general form of lichens the crustose variety. Okay, so I wanted to turn your attention back to something that we discussed in fall quarter of Fungal Kingdom, which is the Ways of Enlightenment website and the Morpho Group Index, which is a really nice way of organizing lichens based on their growth forms. And here we can see the category of crusts broken up as pimples, scripts, buttons, and dust. So I just wanted to remind you that there's great photographs here um, to help you as you're learning to identify crusts. So this is the pimples. These are chlorolichens. That's lichens that have a green algal photobiont partner with pimple-shaped parathesia. And I'll introduce this idea of parathesia. You learned about this again in fall quarter when we learned about lichen reproduction, but this is just one form of sexual reproduction structures um, that lichens can have. Okay, then there's the crusts buttons, and these are chlorolichens with round apothecia. You can see a variety of forms here. The dusts. So these are the uh, crustose lichens that lack a cortex. So I mentioned that some of them are what we call lepros um, after the lichen lepraria here. And um, these lichens rarely, if ever, go through sexual reproduction. And so they're primarily reproducing asexually. Um, and so they don't have to produce apothecia or parathesia. Then we have the scales. These are chlorolichens and cyanolichens consisting of numerous tiny short fish scales. So they kind of look like shingles or scales. Here you can see a seroma. Um, we have a sora here and normandina. You'll see this one growing on alder. Um, on the Evergreen campus. It's really, really cute and very, very small. So these are the scales. And then finally, the stick pins. These are the calicioid lichens or the pin lichens. And they have a crusty or squamulose uh, primary thallus that you can see growing on the wood here. This one happens to be this beautiful chartreuse color. This is Calicium viridi um, with a tiny erect fruiting structure. Um, and smudgeable spores, okay, that means that basically this type of modified apothecia called a mesidium, the spores are directly available uh, to float out on the wind, unlike an apothecia where the spores have to be ejected. So a typical apothecia. And so this is a mesidium, a little fruiting structure. And keep in mind that the scale here, these are extremely small. Um, you need a hand lens to be able to see them on, on wood, typically. Okay, so let's review some terminology that you can use to describe the overall shape and texture of crustose lichens. And I want to remind you that if you were able to purchase Bruce McCune's Micro Lichens of the Pacific Northwest Keys, um, this is a great resource. And in the first volume, there's a wonderful illustrated glossary with all of these terms. And so I encourage you to use that. I'll also share some other resources online if you haven't purchased the micro lichens textbooks where you can find online glossary for lichen terms. So this is just an introduction, but I'm going to expect that when you're keying out crustose lichens that you're looking up the terms that you don't know. So the first thing I want to introduce is the idea of what we call the prothallus. This is a fringe of unlichenized 
fungi that occurs on the edge of the thallus. So you might have observed colonies of crustose lichens growing intermixed, and they have this kind clearly defined border that separates them. Well, this is usually what we look what we refer to as the prothallus. So it's just a layer on the fringe of the lichen that um, is composed only of the fungus, not the algae. And sometimes it can be kind of this black line. Sometimes it can look, take on like a bluish tinge as you see here under the Parmiella tri tryptophylla. And sometimes it can be this amazing, brilliant hot pink. And this is not a species that grows in our region. It grows in southeastern United States and in the tropics, but this is Cryptothesia rubrocinta, which has this hot pink prothallus. So uh, this is a really cool feature. And if you ever come across that term, now you know what it means. Okay, more terms for crustose lichens. So um, again, every time you find a term you don't know, the best thing to do is look it up, but just as an introduction, when we think about the general form of crust, you're gonna see some words to describe what it looks like. So endosubstratal are crusts that are actually growing within the substrate. So they might actually be within the rock or bark that they're growing on. Lepros is composed entirely of powdery granules, as I mentioned. So these are like the dust lichens. You might have a continuous, smoother, unbroken thallus. And the way these cross sections work, the black dots are representing the photobiont layer and the uh, lines here are representing the hyphal uh, component like the medulla or the cortex. Uh, this would be the medulla here. Continuous or smooth, you can see there's no lower cortex here. Um, rimos is broken up by deep cracks that may close up when the thallus is wet. So, you know, these cracks here are kind of like almost like teeth, you know, the spaces between your teeth. So they're good for absorbing moisture to form a kind of a continuous layer. Areolite, this is more broken up and this can be regular or irregular, contiguous or dispersed on the substrate. So that's areolite, that's a really common form. We have bullate. This is bulging upwards. They um, almost look like bubbles. And we have lobate. So these are crusts that actually have lobes. So we, we see a lower and upper cortex on the edges here that are detached from the, the substrate. That's an actual lobe. And then squamules. Um, so you're familiar with that from Cladonia, from macrolichens probably. They have the primary thallus composed of squamules. So these are just little scales, right, that have uh, kind of like individual seedlings almost um, of crustose lichen. And then finally we have verrucose and verruculose. And so this is just uh, referring to it, the texture of lichens where it resembles warts. It's a rough and bumpy texture and it comes from the lichen verrucaria, um, which you'll find in our region as a real maritime influenced um, species growing on rocks and intertidal areas. Um, and then this is just another example here. So we have like areolate. So we have these kind of, uh, you know, deep cracks separating the uh, different areas of the lichen, but then we also have this kind of warty cauliflower like look to it and that's ver verrucose. Okay, so I mentioned we have different types of asexual reproductive structures in lichens and a lot of these hand-drawn images are taken from the Lichens of North America textbook, and I've posted these readings. If you attended Fall Quarter Fungal Kingdom, you would have already read Chapter 2 and Chapter 3, which cover the morphology and anatomy of lichens and the sexual and asexual reproductive structures, but this is a great review if you would like to revisit this, especially the sage the pages and sections that I assigned, and you can look for that in the Crestos Lichen module on Canvas. So parathesium, the singular, parathesia, the plural, refer to flask-shaped fungal fruiting body structures with an opening at the tip. So these are typically pear-shaped or flask-shaped shaped structures that are somewhat embedded within the lichen. So when you're looking down, you're really only seeing that opening in the tip called the osteole. And then inside you'll have the hymenium and the as assi with the ascospores inside. And so we'll look at the anatomy of an apothecia. This is just a different kind of fruiting structure called a parathesia. And in terms of lichens that um, I'm familiar with, I think there's more lichens with apothecia um, that I uh, am aware of, but parathesia are also something that you're going to want to know because you're going to come across these in crustose lichens. 
Now, this isn't to be confused with pycnidium, which are structures that produce conidium or conidia, plural. And these are asexual reproductive structures. Um, and these are produced on some lichens that you'll encounter, but they have this same flask-like shape. So that's an important distinction is to just know that these are not sexual structures. They just have a similar shape. Okay, so types of apothecia. So I'm not gonna go through the definitions of like the technicalities on all of these, but this is just some examples as you're keying out lichens, you might come across some of these words. So I'll say them all for you so that you can get used to hearing them. So we have lecidine, lecanorine, arthenoid, gyros, or yeah, gyros, lyrile, mazidium, pertusarioid, double walled, and apothecia raised on a pedicia. So you're used to this with cladonia. But a lot of these refer to crustose lichen apothecia. So sometimes they don't have a phthalene margin. So, you know, the phthalus is here, but this one doesn't have the phthalene margin. But the lecanorine does. It has this margin of phthalus surrounding it. Um, there's all kinds of, you know, definitions, and you can look them up in your glossaries. But the important thing is that we kind of get to you're going to have to cross section these and look at the structures and the composition of both the apothecia the and the ascospores so that's kind of what i want to cover today so if we look at the cross section of kind of a typical uh apothecia this is one that has a phthalene margin on it all of them will kind of be composed of these different tissues and this is what i want you to be familiar with because you're going to be learning about these terms as you use the keys so the epithecium is the layer above the assi, consisting of the tips of the paraphyses embedded in gelatinous matrix, okay? So sometimes this can be pigmented. So when you are looking down at the disc of the apothecia, you might observe that it has a color. Well, that color is embedded in the epithecium. Then you have the hymenium. Now this is the real kind of meat and potatoes of the apothecia. This is where it's all happening. This is where you find the assi that have the ascospores inside of them. And you also have the paraphyses. And this is just sterile tissue that grows in between the fertile tissue of the assay. So I'll show you some real actual photographs of the hymenium, but this is like the money layer. This is like where all the sexual reproduction business is occurring. Then we have the hypothesium. This is the tissue below the hymenium that supports it. And um, this might have some characteristics that you need to look at. Sometimes it can be pigmented. And then you have the excapole. The excapole is the tissue forming underside the rim of the apothecia. So the excapole can extend kind of around the edges in some apothecia all the way up here, or it can just kind of be below, just depending on what kind of apothecia it is, you know, looking back at this, right? So the excapole might be all around it, or it might not. Okay, then we have the phallus that you're used to looking at with the photobiont layer, the medulla, and in this case, this, this particular crust has a lower cortex, okay? So this is showing you a cross-section of an apothecia. So maybe this is a, like a folius like, and it could be, right? Okay. Okay, so apothecia in section. And again, these images are in your Lichens of North America chapters. So check it out there. I think it's chapter three. So here we have a couple of different types of apothecia in section, but you can follow along looking at the um, hypothesium, which is the area underneath the hymenium, and then the epi epihymenium above, right? And then the excapole, you have the inner and the outer. Sometimes the excapole can be carbon carbonaceous, meaning blackened or colored. Um, Sometimes the excapole is not carbonaceous, so it's just like a light color. You have these are representing the photobiont cells. So in some apothecia, the photobiont do not extend into the excapole, where in other uh, apothecia, they do. And this is why you need to learn how to cross-section an apothecia, because part of the key might say, are the algae present in the excapole, right? So there's actually like a margin here that contains photobiont cortex, you know, all of that. And um, 
it looks like the way they're describing it here, it's like this is the excapole kind of underneath that. And then this is like the thalene margin, right? Where you have like these layers, whereas this is excapole without a thalene margin. So that, that, that could be an important distinction. In this one on the right, you have thallus being really distinct from the excapal layer, it almost pulled away from it. So that tells me that like the thalene margin is distinct from the excapal. And here it's just a little bit more of a, a, um, a smoother transition between the two areas. Um, and then this one doesn't have algae in it, but this one does. So these are just subtle differences that you're gonna be looking for. This would be what like a Lyrale apothecia. So in a graphis, um, like an elongated tunnel kind of thing where you have the disc in here, right? And then the excapole kind of wrapping around. Okay, and then this is showing another kind. I can't remember right now what this type is called. I have to look back at the um, legend for this figure, but you can see the um, assay here arranged and the, per, um, the paraphyses is, is kind of this tissue surrounding it all around. So this is just some different views that you might find when you section it into an apothecia. Okay, and then so I just want to point this out. So within the hymenium, I said there's the assay and the paraphyses. So the assay is what we're going to be looking at now. These are the spore containing cells. And so these are going to all be lined up in the hymenium. And this is just showing you different ways it could look. So you could have, um, typically they have, um, eight would be like a number that I would expect, like eight spores, okay? So like here's an assay with eight spores, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight. And these spores um, have a bunch of different, you know, septa in them. So it looks like they're like all divided up. Sometimes you can have spores that are simple like this, but sometimes you can have tiny spores that are like a lot of spores inside of an, one assay. Sometimes they can be more round shaped. Sometimes they're elongated, but typically I would say like, you're going to see something like this, you know, or something like this. Okay. And so this is a great way to view spores. If you can see them in the assay, sometimes they can be ejected out. And then this is the ascus wall. Um, and this is this part called the tholus, not to be confused with the phallus. Um, and so basically what this is showing you is that the tip of the ascus can have different characters too that you need to look at. So these are like the little helmets or the lids that are on top of the assay. So just note that there might be characteristics that you need to look at there as well. Okay. Next is the actual spore. So within the assay, you have spores and those spores can look different as well. So you have like three layers. You have the apothecia, which has characteristics, the assay, and now the ascospore. So this is getting more and more um, micro in the view we're taking. And there's gonna be all kinds of shapes. So here's a simple ellipsoid, here's two-celled, here's polar locular. So like there's a little like chambers that are kind of polarized within a cell. They could be needle shaped with multiple septa, fusiform. So that was like this one here kind of. Um, oh no, no, actually this is more of a miriform cell. So if you look at this, it's got all these little chambers. Septate, so the septa are really thick here. And then some simple spores can have this halo around them. So that's something um, to look for as well. So I have a video that I made that um, reviews different techniques for sectioning an apothecia. And this is just a little drawing of how that might be done. And so these little slivers are what you're going to put on your slides with a drop of water and sometimes with KOH in order to visualize the assay and the spores. So please do review that video and just know that there's a section in the Lichens of North America, chapter 13 that I've assigned that also uh, reviews this in a written way. So that's a good thing for you to look at as well. Okay, and then just to finish up, we have a few images of some common, um, well, this one, Mycoblastus sanguinarius is a common lichen in our area. And it's distinct in that, um, it has a 
blood red hypothesium. So if you cross section through it, even with your naked eye in the field, you can see this red layer directly underneath the hymenium. And so under the microscope, you basically see red. And then here's the hymenium. The hymenium has acai with ascospores inside. So here's a spore. And then the paraphyses are just like the tissue that grows in between the um, acai. So this is just like giving you some real life things to look at. Okay, just to give you a couple more views. So like here is Lyrolay apothecia of graphis. So they're like these little lines that look like pencil marks on the bark. And if you sliced in a cross section, this is what it would look like. And then it looks like, you know, the acai are all kind of scrunched up into this little area here. And so this is like an acai containing multiple ascospores that are multi-septate. So these are individual spores. You can see like the halo around them that would come out of this ascus. So that's something that you could look for there. And then this one, I don't know what lichen it is, but it's just a nice visual of showing you like the epithesium. It's a little pigmented. Then you have the acai with the paraphyses in between them. And then the ascospores are just neatly lined up in here inside of the acai. Then you have the um, uh, the hypothesium underneath the lichen um, with the excapole. So this is um, this is probably the hypothesium here. And then you have like medullary excapole and then the outer excapole here tissue. And so um, all lichens are going to look different when you look at their apothecial tissue, but this is just to pro provide you with kind of an overview. So dive in, watch the other video about more technically how to make cross sections and have fun with this project. And we'll be together in open lab um, during our synchronous lab times. I'll be available to you as a resource for identifying actual um, genus, uh, genera and species. All right, thank you very much.